When we think of archaeology, movie characters such as Indiana Jones and Laura Croft, or television shows like the Travel Channel's Expedition Unknown immediately come to mind. While the thrill of the adventure and the hunt for undiscovered artifacts and treasure appear exciting, at the heart of it all, at USDA's Natural Resources Conservation Service, archaeologists are dedicated to protecting and preserving our history and cultural heritage. Referred to as cultural resource specialists, these state leaders provide cultural resource awareness training to NRCS conservation planners and partners, as well as manage the NRCS cultural resource program for their respective state. In this two-part video, buckle up and hold on tight as we take you on a journey through our beginnings as the Soil Conservation Service in the 1930s, the reorganization as the Natural Resources Conservation Service in 1994, and to our conservation mission that includes working with farmers, ranchers, and partners on conservation programs. You'll see the importance NRCS places on environmental concerns, including taking into account the effect of our conservation practices on cultural resources and the consultation process with state historic preservation offices and American Indian tribes. Speaking of looking into the past, where did we come from? Created in response to the Dust Bowl, NRCS is an agency of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. NRCS is a non-regulatory federal agency that works with private landowners and partners on a voluntary basis. A history of helping people help the land. We draw on a long history of helping people help the land. For more than 80 years, NRCS has worked in close partnerships with farmers and ranchers, local and state governments, other federal agencies, and our state's locally led conservation districts to maintain healthy and productive working landscapes. NRCS Beginnings On April 27, 1935, Congress passed Public Law 74-46, in which it recognized that the wastage of soil and moisture resources on farm, grazing, and forest lands is a menace to the national welfare, and established the Soil Conservation Service as a permanent agency in the USDA. In 1994, SCS's name was changed to the Natural Resources Conservation Service to better reflect the broadened scope and expanded mission of the agency's concerns. In doing so, Congress reaffirmed the federal commitment to the conservation of the nation's soil and water resources, first made more than 80 years ago that continues to this day. What do we do and how do we do it? We support America's farmers, ranchers, and forest landowners through financial and technical resources and services we offer to help producers make conservation work for them. The system of practices we promote is helping them improve their operations, reduce the cost of production, and conserve our natural resources for the future. Our work is made possible by the Agriculture Improvement Act, commonly known as the Farm Bill, a package of national legislation passed roughly every five years by Congress and then signed into law by the President. Through the Farm Bill, we deliver a host of programs, like the Conservation Technical Assistance Program, or CTA, the Environmental Quality Incentives Program, or EQIP, and the Conservation Stewardship Program, or CSP, just to name a few. NRCS invests an average of $8 million every day of the year into conservation systems that help producers stay profitable and productive. Let's look at cultural resources as part of NRCS planning efforts. Do you enjoy looking at your family's photo albums or hearing stories about your parents and grandparents? Are family traditions important to you? Most of us are interested in our personal histories. We want to know about the past because it helps us recognize who we are, how we became who we are, how we are similar, as well as different from others. In a broader sense, it is important to all of us to preserve the past, our cultural heritage, a legacy of over 10,000 years in North America. It is sometimes difficult to piece together the story of humankind. These stories await discovery in the fragile traces of the past. We call these traces of the past cultural resources, and many of these traces are preserved on the surface of the ground and buried in the soil of our farms and cities. As part of the NRCS conservation planning process, when we proceed to work with a farmer or rancher, called a producer, we look at cultural resources as part of the environmental compliance process. Yeah. All right, with this form, and when you do projects with the government, we have to consult with the Fish and Wildlife Service, NOAA, Fisheries, all that. 
in the State Historical Preservation Office. So what this form does is it gives a gives NRCS permission to consult and release your pertinent information about the project with SHPO and the tribes. The NRCS encounters a variety of cultural resources during the conservation planning process. These may include prehistoric or historic archaeological sites, buildings, structures, features, or objects. While structures are generally easy to identify and avoid, NRCS employees commonly encounter non-structural archaeological sites. These often extend below the soil surface. When significant cultural resources are found within NRCS project areas of potential effects, the NRCS must mitigate potential impacts to these resources. What does that involve? Let's take a look. Our first cultural resources adventure takes us to Mineral County, south of Hawthorne, where we encountered some historic rock buildings near the project area. With water out on these rangelands, typically uh, everything's attracted to water and there's not much water. So we have a lot of wildlife use around spring sources. And we also have historic use in this area, more like mining. And then we have prehistoric use from the uh, Paiute Indians. So one of the things we do when we have our clients install projects is we uh, look for cultural resources and then we try to make sure that we don't impact them. And on this spring development, there's some uh, historic rock buildings here that were very close to the spring, but the client installed everything in such a way that we avoided any impacts to these historic sites. Why does NRCS care about cultural resources? It's an important part of our conservation efforts. NRCS protects cultural resources for the same reason it protects natural resources like the soil, water, air, plants, and animals on a producer's property. While keeping natural resources in balance helps provide the basis for a healthy and profitable farm or ranch environment, protecting and interpreting significant cultural resources provides the basis for understanding our human past. We are all stewards of the soil and water on our property, the organisms that inhabit it, and the heritage information that it contains. In addition to conservation, it's the law. NRCS must adhere to NHPA and NEPA. Recognizing the importance of cultural heritage and the rate of its destruction, Congress passed and President Lyndon Johnson signed the National Historic Preservation Act in 1966. The act establishes a policy for protecting important cultural resources, also called historic properties. It requires federal agencies to consider cultural resources in their activities and to determine if any historic properties will be affected by those activities. Cultural resources are archaeological sites and may be defined as any physical evidence of past human activities, by law greater than 50 years of age. Archaeological sites can include structures such as barns, houses, factories, and prehistoric sites, as well as sites that are of traditional significance to groups of people. A great example of this is in Oravada, Nevada, about 40 miles north of Winnemucca, the next stop on our cultural resources adventure. We're out here at Rebel Creek Ranch out of Orvada. These clients are EQIP participants. This ranch used to be a stage stop in the late 1800s. Knowing that, we had to take that into account at the beginning of the planning process. The project included a pipeline that went from the mouth of the canyon all the way down the drainage to convey water to their irrigation system. We we're fortunate enough to be able to salvage a, an existing pipeline through the headquarters. We were able to use that pipeline and not have to disturb any ground within that headquarters area. So fortunately, we were able to complete this project without having any impact to the historical property you see behind me. So in the early 1900s, this was actually an original stagecoach stop. And this is where they would tie the saddle horses throughout, and that's where people would bunk. And then they'd feed them for the people over the night, and then they could stay for however long they wanted. And this is the original barn that they house those saddle horses in. So the Snaps were actually the original people who founded the ranch. And along the barn, you can see initials to where they kind of carved their names into the sides of the, ba of the barn and the earliest one here is 1911. There's ones all the way up from 1903 to 1915. 
and it's extremely neat to see the history still on the walls of the original barn. Simply stated, cultural resources are the past activities and accomplishments of people. They include buildings, objects or artifacts, locations, and less tangible resources such as dances, stories, and holiday traditions. Cultural resources are non-renewable. There is no way to grow a new archaeological site or historic house after it is destroyed. The National Historic Preservation Act provides protection of cultural resources that have been determined to be of significant value. What makes a cultural resource significant? To be considered significant, a cultural resource must meet one of our four National Register criteria for National Register of Historic Places eligibility. One, associated with an event or events that have made a significant contribution to a major pattern of American history. Two, associated with significant people of the American past. Three, embodies the distinctive characteristics of a type period or method of construction. Four, has yielded or may yield information important in history or prehistory. After these four criteria have been assessed, the integrity of the cultural resource must be considered. Some cultural resources show no evidence of disturbance and are intact, while other cultural resources may be highly disturbed. Significant cultural resources are called historic properties. Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act states that federal agencies must take into account the effect of their practices on historic properties. Training our employees. Nationally, NRCS has established procedures for training conservation planners and partners to complete limited field reviews under the supervision of an NRCS cultural resource specialist. Cultural resource specialists in their respective states help complete cultural resource surveys for large projects and when cultural resources are found to be adjacent to or within proposed NRCS projects. Let's listen in to our state cultural resource specialist training class. Sometimes uh, when you're doing archaeological surveys you find historic artifacts like these bottles here. And these bottles came from a historic site that was dated to 1905. And there's some very interesting characteristics on these bottles that can help you to identify the dates of the bottles. Because if you look at this bottle, it doesn't tell you much, does it? Mm -hmm. Well, if you look at the bottom, they have embossed maker marks on the bottom of lots of these bottles. And as you can see, there's one, uh, there's, uh, one right there. And that one says SMB and GC, and underneath it there is a 16. The 16 is a maker mark, and the SB and GC is the bottle making company right there. This one right here has a AB, and underneath it it has Y30, and the, the Y30 under here is the bottle making manufacturing location. And this one you see doesn't have anything on it, uh, but it's just got these concentric circles on it, and that is a machine maker mark on there. So these two bottles you can really tell something about. And there's this book that you can go to called Bottle Makers and Their Marks, a really handy reference. And if you look up AB in this, it turns out that AB is an Anheuser-Busch bottle and it dates to 1904 to 1907. The SB and GC, and that is a Stratur Bottle and Glass Company, and it dates to about 1881 to 1905. So these two bottles here probably are from uh, 1904 and 1905, and that fits very, very well with the archaeological site that we have out there. The other thing you can tell from these bottles, the other thing you can look at, you notice it's got a bottle manufacturing seam that goes all the way up the bottle on both sides. This one has the same thing here. NRCS Procedures for Cultural Resources Surveys Cultural resource surveys for NRCS projects are required when the projects are federal undertakings where the NRCS is the lead agency and the projects have a potential to affect historic properties. 
Effects to historic properties can either be direct effects related directly to the project implementation or indirect effects including visual, auditory, olfactory, or cumulative effects. The NRCS seeks to identify, evaluate, and avoid impacts to historic properties. The cultural resource environmental compliance is done early in the planning process, well in advance of actual project implementation. Projects utilizing NRCS funding to implement an activity in a conservation plan must follow these general cultural resources protection procedures. There are five basic steps in the Section 106 compliance process. When we begin to work with a producer, we have to do two things for cultural resources environmental compliance. One of them is to determine whether it is a federal action. And that, in other words, would be, are we providing federal dollars to uh, help implement some of these practices? A second thing would be to see if this practice has the potential to affect any cultural resources. Um, and that would be considered like an undertaking. So here in front of me, I have um, a list of different conservation practices that are considered undertakings or not undertaking. So I will consult this list and if one of my practices falls within this range, then I will proceed doing my cultural resources compliance review. Step two, identify the project impact area and known cultural resources within the project area. Determine the entire area that will be altered during construction of conservation activities, referred to as the Project Area of Potential Effects acronym APE or APE. This can include the area where activities are planned, but it can also include additional areas for such activities as equipment staging and material borrowing. After we determine that it is a federal undertaking, or in other words, a ground disturbing practice, then I'll come onto the computer and I'll fill out our EVC-01 form. And that form collects the, the producer, the practice name, number, how many acres we are affecting, and a project description. Once I'm done filling out that, it goes to our state cultural resource specialist with a topo map of the area. We also, in kind of conjunction with all this, will send a consultation letter to any concerned tribes in the area. We also attach a topo map of the location with no PII information on it. I get on the computer and I check various historical documents to see what known archaeological sites are within our project area of potential effects. And the first thing I look at is the NVCRIS SHPO database. Uh, that's a database that the SHPO office has. It's a limited access database that I have permission to look at. And uh, I can tell what known previously recorded archaeological sites are out there within our potential area of effect. After I see what known archaeological sites are within our area of potential effect, I can look at other historical documents such as the water rights database that the, uh, that the state engineers have, and I can look at old government land office maps. So there are about three or four different uh, historical documents that I can look at. On that note, our next stop takes us clear over to the Nevada-Utah border, 120 miles east of Elko at Pilot Peak to a previously recorded site. Sometimes when we do our historical record searches, we find that there are previously recorded archaeological sites that are within our project area potential effect. In this instance, we found that there was a pipeline recorded that came out of the springs in back of me, down this way, into a concrete box, which is right here, and headed out west across the valley floor. Uh, we believe, looking at the historical records, that this pipeline is about 1930s. This is the pipeline that I was just talking about. Um, as you can see, it is crossing a drainage here. The only time that you're gonna see this pipeline is really where it crosses a drainage. If you go this way a little bit, you can see a berm of uh, where the pipeline was uh, located or is located. Um, the pipeline is about 4.5 miles long. We're looking along the berm of the pipeline here, and it's a buried pipeline, and you can't see a heck of a whole lot, but it's fairly easy to detect the berm here, and you can see in back of me where it is going through the trees here. This is the concrete box that I was just talking about that the pipeline goes into. It comes into this concrete box in back of me, 
and it heads, then it heads out in that direction, west, out into the valley floor. Again, this concrete box is, dates to about 1930, and this concrete box, however, is not within our area of potential effect. Once I have seen what sites are out there, then I make a decision as to whether a cultural resource specialist needs to be out there, such as myself, to do the cultural resource survey, or whether our trained field office personnel can do the cultural resource survey. Earlier we explained that effects to historic properties can be direct effects or indirect effects, including visual, auditory, olfactory, or cumulative effects. What would indirect effects look like? Let's take a journey to the southeast part of the state, roughly 100 miles northeast of Las Vegas as the crow flies, to the Thule Desert in Lincoln County. One example of a visual effect would be construction of a solar panel. The NRCS would need to consider the visual effect this might have on any existing historic properties. An example of a cumulative effect would be installing a trough and considering how the trampling from cows would affect the range or vegetation in that area over time. If I have told the field officers that they can complete the cultural resource survey, they complete the cultural resource survey. And if they find any archaeological sites when they are doing the survey, they notify me right away. And I get out there and I determine what mitigation efforts that we need to do for the archaeological sites that are within our area potential effect. A great example is our next stop in Lovelock, where we discovered and preserved a concrete portion of a headgate with a historic stamp. I had a producer come in the office. They wanted us to come assist them with replacing their old concrete structures and board inserts that they had in their current irrigation system with new concrete and new metal jack gates like this or metal inserts. I came out here and did my inventory after I visited with the producer. I, um, first of all, I had a file search ran with our state archaeologist to make sure there was no previously recorded archaeological sites in the area. Um, then I come out and I did my uh, survey. And when I came across this concrete structure, I noticed it has a CCC Camp 36 with the 1937 date stamped into the structure. So that right off the bat triggered me to contact my state archaeologist to come out and evaluate the, the site. After I was notified that there was this head gate out here that was over 50 years of age, that means it's an archaeological site. So I had to come out here and examine it to uh, see whether it was eligible for the National Register. And if so, it would be considered an historic property. The NRCS decided to leave this structure in an unevaluated category for the National Register, which means that it is potentially eligible for the National Register. We mitigated our impacts to this site by leaving the concrete in place and we simply replaced the uh, sliding boards. Many of these head gates have been maintained over a long period of time, and there is no easy way to find out how old a lot of these head gates and cross gates are. However, some of these head gates and cross gates do have inscriptions on them, and this one here has a inscription that says CCC Camp 36, 1937. And it turns out that there was a CCC, Civilian Conservation Corps camp, located here in Lovelock between 1935 and 1938. And most of the work that they did was out on the construction of the Rye Patch Dam, but they also did some construction and maintenance work on, on head gate, cross gates, and turnouts. The field office after they complete the survey, they fill out our culture resource field review sheet and they send the results in to me. And I forward those results to our State Historic Preservation Office for concurrence. The State Historic Preservation Office is one of our concerned parties that we need to consult with on, on all ground disturbing projects. NEPA. Our compliance with the National Environmental Policy Act happens at the same time as our compliance with the National Historic Preservation Act. However, compliance with NEPA alone does not substitute for compliance with the NHPA. We must comply with both. 
The National Environmental Policy Act of 1969, or NEPA, directs federal agencies to administer federal programs and resources to foster the quality of the human environment. The Act requires federal agencies to preserve important historic, cultural, and natural aspects of our national heritage. NEPA in the context of cultural resources planning. The NRCS planning model deals with five natural resource environmental concerns, soils, water, air, plants, and animals, as well as human considerations and energy. Cultural resources are considered as part of the H of the acronym SWAPA plus HE in the NRCS planning process. NRCS's CPA 52 NEPA environmental evaluation form is used to document the baseline condition of cultural resources and the effect of the project on cultural resources in addition to other environmental concerns. To conclude our cultural resources portion of our environmental compliance, we will receive a final letter of determination of effects from our state cultural resources specialist. In that letter, he will list out our baseline documentation, our no action, and our alternative action. We'll take that information of the effects on our projects and we'll put it into our CPA 52, which is our environmental evaluation form. At this point in time, this completes our NEPA and our Section 106 compliance review. When can a project begin? No project may begin until all NRCS required environmental compliance, including cultural resource surveys, has been completed and all NRCS consultation has been completed. What if we discover something during construction? Excellent question. If unanticipated archaeological sites are found within the project area of potential effects during project construction, all work stops and NRCS works with the producer to mitigate impacts to historic properties. Why are cultural resources important? Cultural resources are important because it is our cultural heritage and it is being destroyed rapidly. But cultural resources also provide many useful benefits to people today. They expand our knowledge and understanding of history, provide scientific data important to conservation efforts like past climate, floods, droughts, fire regimes, species diversity, irrigation methods, and more. Attract tourists who bring money into rural communities and create additional jobs. Provide employment in rural areas during renovation, research inventory and analysis. Stimulate other community improvements and provide educational opportunities for our children. Part 2, NRCS Nevada Common Practices. What are the most common practices NRCS Nevada does and what do they look like? Let's take a look. Irrigation Pipeline. Okay, what we're looking at behind me is a PVC pipeline and I got the main line. Well, you can see it behind me, the, the larger black pipe and then it converts to PVC and it goes, oh, I'd say about close to a mile upstream to West Main Canal where it starts. So originally this was an open ditch. The problem with open ditches is they need a lot of maintenance. You got to clean them at least twice a year to get good water flow delivery. And, and with uh, past irrigation programs, um, the funding just wasn't there to do ongoing maintenance throughout the year. So the first watering of the year was usually good because the ditches were clean. But then throughout the summer, they would be cluttered with vegetation and water delivery was, was very low. And so these pipelines, very low maintenance. Once, once they're in the ground, they're in the ground, they have a, a lifespan. I'm um, hearing at least 60 years, probably longer. Water delivery is always gonna be at a constant because there's nothing impeding that flow. It's going to be very beneficial to this whole valley. Our irrigation project is approximately 12,000 acres and uh, 40 acre land tracts. Our thoughts are to put pipelines into every existing tribal delivery ditch 
coming off of the canal systems. And once that's in place, individuals within their own land tracks can apply through EQIP to put the pipelines branching off of the main lines. And water delivery is, is, is really critical, especially when you grow alfalfa, because a person can get up to three cuttings of alfalfa here in the valley, even though we have a real short window, um, somewhere in the neighborhood of 90 days growing season. But you can still get three cuttings if you time it right and you have good water delivery. And with these pipelines, I see that happening in the future. You know, it, it's not only for the generation now, but it's for the future, the, the children and beyond that. It's gonna benefit them years to come. So that's what I see and that's what I envisioned. Before I got this pipeline in, it would take me at least 10 days to get, to get my field uh, irrigated. It would come under the road up into this other track and into my field and when it would come into my field I'd actually have to irrigate uphill so it would take me at least 10 days and I would get like 60 to 65 percent coverage and I'd only get uh, one cutting and I'd, I'd try to get one to one to three waterings a year and even with that it's I'd lose a lot of water into the field next to me because of the, the poor ditch, you know, and where it comes from, it's not efficient. Once I applied for this pipeline, I was, I was kind of skeptical when I saw the design because it was so flat. I'm, I'm standing right here at the end of my pipeline. I didn't expect this. I didn't, I didn't expect this much pressure, this much water. It, it's amazing how much water is at my fingertips versus what it used to be. It used to take me five hours to move water a day, two and a half hours in the morning, two and a half hours in the evening to try to move water. Now it's 30 minutes, 30 minutes in the morning, 30 minutes in the evening. And it's, it's such an improvement now that my next year is gonna be amazing for hay. Structure for water control. Water and access to water are main resource concerns we face here in Nevada. NRCS will help with a wide range of projects from livestock pipelines to irrigation pipelines to water conveyance ditch maintenance. Different types of maintenance that are done in irrigation ditches include lining earthen ditches with concrete, repairing old concrete ditches, or installing or maintaining existing water control structures in the ditches. Um, there are a couple main types of water control structures that we deal with. The names may vary depending on where you are, but we deal with a lot of outlets or turnouts, and those are the ones that go directly out into your field. And then we also deal with ones that are in the ditch that we call cross gates or head gates. Some of the maintenance we do on them is replacing the concrete when they're old or outlive their lifespan. It's too small, inadequate to convey the proper amount of water. So a lot of these old gates, they'll have board inserts in them where you have to literally move every board out to get the water to flow through and then put the boards back in. So, and they leak. So we'll go and replace them with a gate that's similar to the one behind me. They're called metal inserts, jack gates, again, different terminology, but it allows for easier control of your water and it stops the leakage from occurring that occur into the field or around. Here's an example of a water control structure, an outlet or a turnout, however you want to call it, that has not been uh, modified with a metal jack gate or metal insert. This one has board inserts, so when I refer to a gate with board inserts, this is what it would resemble. They're all varying sizes. This one's quite large. We would come in here and replace probably all co the concrete and the board inserts. So the boards, how they work is there's these gate, there's these slides and to shut your water off, you put them in there like that and you stack them up. And this allows a lot of water to leak through boards and cracks and stuff. So that's why we come in to replace these with a metal jack gate to help cut down on water loss. Like this gate in particular, it has no inscriptions in it. So it is hard to date at how old it is, but this is a good example of one that we work with on a regular basis. Livestock Pipeline. So right now we're in Lincoln County and we're about 120 miles or so north and west of Las Vegas. We're um, 50 miles from the nearest highway on Dirt Road, so it's a pretty remote area. 
We're on BLM land and we're in someone's um, allotment, a permittee's allotment, and um, we're working with the permittee holder, the newbies, on some um, range projects. So where we're at right now is called the Garden Spring Allotment. And behind me in the mountains, these are the Clover Mountains in um, the Garden Spring area. There's a spring on this side called Garden Spring, and then um, up the canyon, um, a bit of ways, maybe 10 miles for both of them is another spring, and that's called Sam's Camp Spring. And so those two spring heads um, bring water essentially down into the allotment because over the years since the 50s, the cowboys have um, brought water from the springs through old kind of pipeline systems and then brought them to troughs so they can get water to livestock so they can graze. And so um, historically, these projects have been going on all over the West. And this one, the original pipe, is now from the 1950s, so many decades old, it's failing, it's broken, and so they've come out and asked us to come out and work with them and see if there are things we can do to help them improve the resources on their allotment. One of the goals of moving the water from the two spring sources up in the, up in the mountains is to move it from the springs through the pipe and then store it at areas along the way and have those storage and troughs be at um, a reasonable walking distance for what we know a cow should walk if you want the cow to gain weight, which of course every livestock producer wants their animals to gain weight, not lose weight. You know, we've got a, an overall plan in this allotment to bring water down through the pipeline system and then have more storage and more troughs so that we can then move the animals and accomplish rotational grazing. So one of the things that we have done is to um, replace almost 10 straight miles of pipe from the original spring source up here in the mountains all the way down to one of the biggest storage tanks that we put in to hold um, an enormous amount of water. That's 66,000 gallons of storage at the first stop. And then that spreads out to these lateral troughs to move the animals across the, the um, allotment. Watering facility. In the allotment, um, we have these two springs that are up to the north of us, and we're on the um, pipeline for the garden spring. The garden spring puts out two to four gallons per minute, or it did when we were first um, here. Historically, that's the output. And of course, that's not a lot of water, and so you, when you can get it somewhere and put it in a trough, you don't want to waste it. You want to save as much of it as you can. And so if you come back to the resource concerns for, your, for this allotment, one of them is um, for the animals, inadequate water, inadequate feed and forage is another. And so one of the ways to um, help resolve the inadequate water is by adding storage through the pipeline system. So before we had pipeline coming down and then basically going straight to troughs, and so however big the trough was, couple hundred gallons, then that's all this basic storage you had. And, and if the animals are out here, you turn it on and you fill up these small containers. And so that's really not facilitating the whole goal for the managers of the land, BLM, in partnership with the permit tee, is to be able to move the animals around on the allotment and um, have rotational grazing and better use the vegetation and the livestock become fat. You know, so the more win-win situation is to be able to do rotational grazing. And you're not going to have that be successful if you don't have water strategically placed so that you can move the animals in the grazing pattern so that you can deliver water to them. And you can't do that if you don't have much water, you know. And so one of the things we suggested is that we do storage. That way they have water on call available. And so when they're not out here using it, or the animals are somewhere on another pipeline, they can continue to fill the tanks, the storage units. So what we've added to the system from on the Garden Spring are six tanks, these big repurposed tanks. And I can feel it, I can hear it filling right now, and I can feel it, it gets um, warm about here, so they're about that full. And so each one of these units is about 22,800 gallons. And so we have three here, so we're just under 70,000 gallons of water that's stored and we're halfway down the pipeline. We're at about mile nine. We got another eight or so miles to the end of this pipeline and we have troughs all along it. And then at the end of the pipeline, we have another three of these. So all together on just this one pipeline on Garden Spring, we have about 125,000 gallons of water now in storage. 
and then plus all of the troughs along the way that are scattered across. So now we can shoot water out to troughs that have been empty for decades because there wasn't enough water to fill the trough and have the animals and then push it to another trough. And so the whole pipeline design has helped facilitate that. Pumping plant and well. Hi, my name is Daniel Veneracci and this is our ranch. Uh, this was also the Diamond Springs Pony Express Station. It was part of the Wells Fargo Freight Company that was not only the Pony Express, but it was a freight company, a telegraph service, and a stage stop. Through the years, it's been let go to disrepair, and when we took it over in 2011, we started working with the NRCS to put it back into good shape. If you look back towards the ranch, some of the original Pony Express buildings still stand today and the trail runs through the property and on up the canyon from where we're standing. My name is Jamie Jasmine. I'm the district conservationist for the Elko Field Office. We cover Elko and Eureka counties and today we're in Eureka County. We've been working with Daniel Venerachi since about 2012. Um, he purchased this property and it was in disrepair when he purchased it. So he was really interested in um, recovering some of those resources that had been lost. He runs a cattle operation, uh, so he was really interested in cattle distribution, installing some livestock waters like this one right here, wells, and, and distributing the water um, to better the resources out here. In our con conservation planning process, we discovered that we were really, really close to the Pony Express Trail. It ran right by his property, actually right through it. So we had to consult with our state cultural resources specialist, and he came out and helped us to lessen the impacts to the trail, um, to avoid impacts to the trail, so we could actually install this project out here. Brush management. I'm Dick Huntsberger and I uh, am the permittee on, on the Churchill Canyon allotment here and, and we are in Churchill Canyon on the uh, border between Mineral and Lyon counties in Nevada and uh, I, there's 48,000 acres here in this grazing allotment. Well, in the course of that time, we've had four fi fires uh, consuming between uh, this allotment and another allotment next to it that I also uh, am the permittee on, the Sunrise allotment. It's burned approximately 10,000 acres in four different fires over the last uh, 18 years. And those fires consume PJ. Well, when you have a PJ fire, um, it burns very intense and it and it destroys all the understory under it. So you know it's just a long recovery period and uh, involves reseeding and the sagebrush is killed and you know it takes many many years for sagebrush to come back and all your grasses and different things are you know a lot of the seed is destroyed because it's so intense. The main reason that uh, that I do these projects is to uh, to support the conservation of the bi-state sage grass. Irrigation land leveling. Many farmers in Nevada flood irrigate their fields, and sometimes the fields are uneven. So when the water runs across the field, it either pools in low spots or high spots are left dry, like an egg carton with little hills and pits. In both cases, different types of weeds fill in, which is highly undesirable and creates a need for herbicides. Farmers work with us to level their land, with a slight slope, which improves water efficiency and their production and reduces or eliminates the need for herbicides. After one of our engineers takes elevation measurements across the field and creates a map with data, the farmer can use that information to fill or cut in the right areas before seeding to level their land. The farmer will input the data into a laser leveling system, like this one, where the instrument in this stand will direct the instrument on the tractor where and when to cut and fill by moving the blade up and down as it moves along the field. Once laser land leveling is done, the farmer sees the soil and waters it. The field should stay level for many years to come depending on the types of crops grown. In the Hardy's case, they grow alfalfa for four to five years, then rotate in a year of cover crops like winter rye in the cold months and Sudan grass in the hot season. They have incorporated a no-till system that keeps the roots in place and helps with soil erosion. Farmers who grow row crops like melon, onions, or garlic can also use land leveling, but many need to do so with a bit more frequency since they disturb the soil a bit more. 
This parcel we're looking at here is a piece that we were irrigating out of open concrete ditches. It had been installed in the late 1950s and the land leveling had taken place at that time. The ditch had deteriorated to the point where we were losing a good share of the water through cracks in the ditch and the leaks in the gates. And the fields had become unlevel over the years uh, through gophers and just movement. We surveyed and land leveled, laser leveled the ground, removed the ditch and installed uh, 18 inch underground pipe with these water redheads that you can see here that we irrigate with. We did this on this uh, little plot here. There's 120 acres in all the fields and at that time we were farming about 90 acres because of the uh, poor water usage. We couldn't get it over the ground so pretty much in the summer we were following about a third of the ground and over the last four years we've uh, re-leveled and re-piped this ground and our efficiency rose to the point that we were able to crop all the ground and in fact we had a little parcel that hadn't been farmed in about 50 years. We had put a dirt ditch in and tried to farm it and was having a hard time and uh, Terry got with us and helped us and we re-leveled it and uh, replaced that with uh, a pipe and so we not only got to farm all the ground that was here uh, year round, we added a little parcel to it so we not only became more efficient with the water, we were able to utilize all of our ground, which our fixed costs are about the same, and by adding that approximate 20 acres to uh, our uh, active production, it was a great boost for us productive-wise and helped us economically and environmentally also. We can control the runoff. We put some ponds in to collect some water, reuse the water. We have a lot less runoff. It's cheaper on our weed control. We have no dry spots, so we use less herbicides. Our fields are clean, and part of that is we get good water coverage and even water coverage. So we've installed some water monitors on top of that to be able to monitor the water so we're not guessing. We're getting, we're trying to come up uh, to where we're, we're a little more scientific on what we're doing so we can make better use and uh, increase our productivity. I'm pretty comfortable in uh, guesstimating that uh, our production has increased around 15 percent, it may be a little higher, and due to about three different factors. One is the total acres farmed is more because we are having better use of the water. So we get to take that water and spread it over more ground through the efficient use of that. Then we are gaining the bottom 100 feet or so on our fields by a good drainage system and less ponding. So uh, before, the bottom of the fields were scalding out and we were losing that on our hay, so there was no production on that. In fact, it was a negative production because it would just be a weed patch or something we had to farm around. And then uh, no dry spots in the field. Uh, the dry spots or the high spots would be a place for the weeds to go, the gophers to go, it caused all kinds of problems. Doing that and you putting all of those together, each one of them seems like a little increase, but you put them together and it's easily a 15% increase to our production. And when you're operating on the narrow narrow uh, window that we are in agriculture, that's a lot. It's, uh, it's changed our whole farming operation to do that. So we went from just getting by and having a really hard time doing it to everything I feel like has come together and has improved greatly and that, that's uh, a great benefit for us. It's pretty much allowing us to stay in business at this point. Hopefully these stories about our NRCS practices have helped illustrate a few of our successful endeavors to put conservation on the ground. To learn more about the variety of practices NRCS does, visit our website at www.nrcs.usda.gov and search using the keyword practices.